It is good to see all of you. Thanks for coming. This is the second in our three-part um, Title IV e Child Welfare Training Program Lunch and Learn series. So last one we had one. We're having uh, this one today on social work with Indigenous communities. And then later today, you'll all be getting an email about our next one, which is on Thursday, April 4th, and focuses on child maltreatment. So that is our three-part series, but today we are so excited to welcome Laura Hebe. Laura is a graduate of our program in MSW in 2015, uh, an alumnus of the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work. She's been a lecturer in the school for the past seven years. Some of, has anyone had Laura for as, okay, one person? A lecturer for the past seven years, teaching social work, American Indian and Indigenous Studies 636, the Indian Child Welfare Act, and social work with Indigenous communities. As an, adopt, an adoptee of Metis Métis. Métis, Métis identity, she's passionate about sharing what knowledge she can with students in social work and related fields throughout this course. She also works on campus, right over here, <laughs> in a department called Academic Coaching to Thrive and Succeed, overseeing the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Educational Achievement's newest program, Indigenous UW, the Network for Development and Growth of Indigenous Scholars. She's also proud to be an auntie to Indigenous scholars at UW-Madison. The aunties, advocates for uplifting Native traditions and Indigenous engagement, are a closely knit network of staff my notes just covered up. <laughs> of staff across campus who work to create community and offer approachable, culturally relevant, and holistic support to students. We're so glad to have you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. So thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I, my primary role, I work right across the, I was gonna say street, right across the little courtyard here on campus. Um, but I've been around here in the school as a student and now um, lecturer for a long time. Um, and um, I know this is the 4E program and you're probably expecting some information on the Indian Child Welfare Act. I'm actually not gonna cover that today um, because really, I realize that is missing in a lot of our curriculum. It's also accessible information to you that I hope you'll go out and do some more personal learning. Um, but I don't think you can really dive into understanding the importance of laws like ICWA without having just some general knowledge, which is hard to cram into an hour, but I took some bits and pieces, so hopefully this flows well. Um, I wanna touch on numerous different subjects. So first, um, Indigenous people are those who have creation stories, not colonization stories, about how we or they, depending on your positionality or identity, came to be in a particular place. Indeed, how we, they, came to be a place. Are their relationships to land comprise, are their epistemologies, ontologies, and cosmetologies? So it's really important to understand the connectedness of Native people to this place that still exists today and is ongoing. Um, we'll come back to that thought, but I want to talk a little bit more about colonialism. I don't see Prezi. <laughs> oh, what did I do? <laughs> So what does that mean to us first as social workers? Colonialism and social work. Um, there's a, hopefully you can see it, if not I can share my slides, kind of talking about um, how settler colonialism has been constructed in our society. But it's really important that we acknowledge and understand that social work is a profession that is a construct of a colonial society of colonialism. You probably all know the history of social work, not gonna go into that, but basically not intended as it was originally created to serve anyone but poor white people essentially, um, not considering other groups in the US um, that were still under periods of active colonialism, you could argue, still are, but um, the social work um, profession follows Eurocentric paradigms and they do not fit everyone we serve um, and we recognize that more and more today but we need to understand that's where we started from as a profession. Social work has played a direct and often implicit role in things that have caused trauma to indigenous communities. Um, 
we can argue to an extent the boarding schools there's a connection with social work um, more you know within the field of education but um, a lot of people who today would probably identify as social workers were in the boarding schools um, implicit in taking native children from their families there was the 60s scoop and the Indian adoption projects in the 50s and 60s where social workers were actively involved along with the Child Welfare League of America in stealing indigenous children from their homes um, and placing them with white families um, in experiments to prove that <coughs> excuse me that white families were better suited to raise native children and in our current system um, there are still the biases and systems that um, lead to a higher rate of native children being removed from their homes than any other group if you look at the bottom, um, this little quote, prior to the passage of the Wisconsin Indian Child Welfare Act, we have our own Indian Child Welfare Act in Wisconsin, and it's pretty cool. It's, it's a lot better than the federal ICWA because it's more expanded, there's more resources, um, and it still hasn't totally um, eliminated the disparities we see. But prior to WICWA, Native children in Wisconsin were about 1,600 times more likely to be removed from their home by public social services than non-Native children. So we just need to start here with acknowledging where our profession lies in relation to different communities we are trying to better serve today. And everything about indigenous research tells us we have to locate ourselves in our research. We talk about this in social work too, but in Western traditional social work, it's more about locating yourself to examine your biases and then checking yourself at the door and making sure you are providing um, fair, equitable services to all without bringing those biases in. Indigenous social work is more about bringing your whole authentic self and realizing that we're all humans and interacting in a more holistic, human way than sometimes we approach people in the field of social work. Um, as just a part of our caseload. Before we write or think about the world, um, we have to locate ourselves, and this is a big task because first we have to come to terms with who we are and how we come to do the work we do. Going back to the previous slide. In that same vein, it's really important being on this campus to acknowledge our campus's history in relation to indigenous people. First of all, you're all familiar with this statement, right? I, I probably don't even need to tell you what it is, the land acknowledgement. We don't have a formal land acknowledgement. This is not a land acknowledgement. Um, this was a plaque intended to acknowledge a piece of history to educate campus. Um, and it's a very short statement. It's a very important statement, but it's very brief. Um, and it's become commonplace, almost in my opinion, complacency to just repeat this, to have it in our email signatures, to say it all the time. Um, and I would challenge you when you're saying that, when you hear others saying it, what is the intention behind that? Like why do you feel compelled to include that? And are you going to take additional action? Are you putting steps in place on a daily basis to respect the indigenous people, um, the indigenous students, staff and faculty and community here at UW-Madison, particularly, but not only the Ho-Chunk Nation. There's 12 nations in Wisconsin and indigenous people in this community from all over the US and, um, and Turtle Island. So instead, I often get asked to do land acknowledgements. And first of all, the highest paid non-indigenous person in the room should be giving your land acknowledgement. Not me, not little old coordinator me should be giving them. So um, push back on those things, but when I do get asked, I take it as an opportunity to share the actual intention behind the statement on the plaque instead of just reciting it. Our shared future, which is the coalition on campus that um, created this plaque um, between campus staff and faculty in the Ho-Chunk Nation. Our shared future is more than a heritage marker. It represents UW-Madison's commitment to respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the other First Nations of Wisconsin. It is a first step that calls on each of us, faculty, staff, and students, to deeply consider our shared past and present with indigenous peoples in this place, they joke, 
and to make our own personal and institutional commitments to achieve a shared future with them. Our shared future is a process, not a land acknowledgement or something to recite. It is very explicit about that on the website, which anyone at UW-Madison can access, yet we still think this is just a land acknowledgement and we say it and we've checked our box and we've done our duty and we can move on. It is a collective act of moving together from ignorance to awareness, an educational framework for posing questions, and an opportunity to celebrate Ho-Chunk people, as well as learn about the hard truths of our histories with them. It is a challenge to educate ourselves and each other and create a better future together. Oops. Um, really quickly, additional campus history. If people are not aware, we have the Morrill Hill Act um, signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln um, in 1862. That's why we have his statue up on Bascom. What did the Morrill Hill Act do? It redistributed nearly 11 million acres from 160 violence-backed land sessions made by close to 250 tribal nations to 52 universities across the nation. So that's why Lincoln sits on top of our hill and we celebrate him all the time. UW-Madison received 235,000 of those acres. Proceeds from this land raised 303 thousand dollars. That amounts in today's value, and this is from 2022, so a few years ago, is about five million dollars. And that's just land, that's not what, that's not any other revenue that our university um, generates, that's just land holdings that the university has. This is showing the um, actual tribal nations and amount of acreage um, and dollar amount of that land. Um, I thought it was on here. It must have fallen off when I transferred this, but there is, uh, it's um, Land Grab U, I believe. If you look it up, there's a website where you can look up any um, Land Grab or Morrill Hill institution in the country and find this information. So I just challenge you when you're walking around campus to examine those histories and think about why do we celebrate the things, the people that we do? Um, and just, just be critical about it and question things. Um, for the sake of time, I can't go into all these images, but I definitely encourage you to go on a cultural landscape tour on campus. Um, they're expanding those, so there's more opportunity for people on campus to attend one of those tours. Okay. So how do we be more inclusive? In 2021, there was a nationwide survey by Echo Hawk Consulting, an indigenous consulting company. Um, and they did a survey, nationwide survey, finding that 40% of respondents didn't think Native Americans still exist. The majority of the US population reports having little to no accurate knowledge of Native Americans. And a lot of that can be attributed to the complete lack of representation in media, pop culture, K through 12 education, um, that not only create, uh, removes us from consciousness, but creates biases, right? We have these inaccurate portrayals in movies that we've had for decades. Um, and so people are less likely to understand and therefore support social justice issues for Native Americans if they have no understanding. And that was by design, right? There was um, genocide going on for, um, <laughs> what's the word, centuries, um, that why would you acknowledge the people you're trying to erase, right? So this is not Americans' fault. This is by design, but once you understand this, you have a responsibility to continue educating yourself and learning more. This is changing, fortunately. We just had Lily Gladstone almost won an Oscar. Um, you know, there's been a lot of more representation in the last few years. Um, and this is her quote about, it's not just mine, how the Oscar um, nod, she didn't win the Oscar, but how that belongs to all indigenous people and everyone who helped her get there um, and everyone before her. 
And really, really cool and important shout out, team of artists from the Oneida Nation here in Wisconsin created her gown, um, including recent graduate who I got to work with when she was here, Paige Skenendor. She owns a business called Moody Indian, so check it out. She does awesome quill and bead work. Um, but yeah, that's really awesome that a bunch of artists from the Oneida Nation um, created this gown here. They did all that quill and bead work. Um, I have music videos and I'll come back to them later. This, um, I'm happy to share this Prezi with you. So this is Nui Janan. It's a, um, that, that's a Cree word and they're a Canada-based company that goes around and helps children from different, different reservations um, create music and produce a song. Um, so they have songs created with tribal communities all over the U.S. and Canada. They're all like middle school, high school students. All really adorable, so check them out. This one is the Winnebago Nation of Nebraska, so I include it in presentations a lot because it's the Ho-Chunk people who were moved from here and remained in Nebraska while many of the Ho-Chunk came back um, after being removed several times. Um, some of them stayed in Nebraska, so a little connection to us here. Okay, so I'm going to play about a three minute video um, just talking about social work from an indigenous perspective. It's muted. Just skip the videos, that's okay. Did someone just say Is it on the iPad? Oh. I think in community we have to really do an intense historical impact and help our people heal because we're still healing from the impact of residential school, the 60s school, what the churches have done, the mental, emotional, physical, sexual, and spiritual abuse, the family violence, the addictions. So it's a different place for us to be a, a, in community, to be able to heal those different parts of our heart, mind, body, and spirit, <coughs> because lots of us have experienced that. In non-native social work, whether it's social worker, social service worker, they don't look at themselves. They look outside of themselves. If it's an indigenous social work program, it's looking within ourselves to be able to heal that. Because if we can heal ourselves, we heal our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our children, our grandchildren. And that's the difference. And it would be culturally based. And it was about, it's about teaching them about the medicines, about being connected to the earth, being connected to creation, and how to rebuild our families because the systems have destroyed our families, almost. But they have did some huge damage, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually to our people. And to be a native Aboriginal social service worker program, it's to rebuild that from the inside out, not outside in. And that's the difference between those two different uh, ways of learning and, and being good caregivers. And uh, having taught in Aboriginal social service worker program before, <coughs> Is that's how we did it. It was um, adult-centered learning. So it was all about the South. And all of those students are awesome. They're doing awesome work out there in the world. And they're using cultural knowledge. They're using the medicines, using ceremony to be able to empower our people. Because if we can empower ourselves, that's what makes good caregivers. And not you can have all the head knowledge you want. That doesn't mean that you're a good caregiver. That means you're just hiding behind those words. And for us, as caregivers, when we're working with our own people, it's easier to understand them because we know that life experience. So it's easier to be more uh, respectful, more kind, more caring. And we know how to interact with them. It's just easier than when it, if it's a non-native caregiver. They're still using their own judgment. They're kind of scared and don't know what to say. And they get nervous. 
So I think there's lots that we can teach them because our my thing is just be who you are. If you're a natural caregiver and you understand the dynamics, it's easier. It just is. But you gotta know who you are. In a non-native social service worker program, they're not teaching them to know who they are. They're teaching them to be something. Social work is just something you do that's not who we are. In an indigenous social work program, it's who we are and it's what we do. Those are two different ways of being in the world and being caregivers. So like I was saying in the beginning, and she said, um, Indigenous social work is about knowing yourself and actually bringing yourself to those interactions. And it's very different than what we're taught in standard social work curriculum. Um, if we're talking about, is the mic still on? I feel like I'm quieter. Yeah, but it's yeah. not a room mic. It's just for the Oh, okay. So if we're talking about decolonization, um, and this is where I see social work students get really, really frustrated with this content about supporting indigenous um, people and communities in general, and also decolonization being such a big, abstract, fuzzy topic. Um, really, I can't, I teach a whole class and I can't really tell you like what specifically you can do it's more about, again, knowing yourself, your relation to other communities, and just being more educated, honestly. Um, if you don't have this foundational knowledge about indigenous people and indigenous communities, which is your responsibility to continue doing that learning, you're gonna come into those interactions with ignorance and fear like she was saying about making a mistake just continue learning and it can be simple fun things like I had on the other slide about indigenous media watch some shows read some books that's not the only thing you should be doing but like some of it can be really fun and entertaining and there's lots of great new indigenous shows and movies out there um, and some of it's more serious doing the work of like learning the history we're touching on very briefly today um, that's impacted indigenous communities about learning more about the Wisconsin Indian Child Welfare Act. There's statewide trainings you can enroll in. Um, so go out there and seek out that knowledge just to be a stronger social worker all around and to be more educated. But so decolonization, um, decolonizing social work and rebuilding indigenous communities this part all belongs to the indigenous communities. It's not all, you have a responsibility, but a lot of it is internal within the communities. Like that, that has to be internal work. So right there, yes, you have a responsibility and I'm not dismissing you from that obligation, but it's not as broad as you think it is. You're here, you're on the social justice spectrum of engagement, creating engagement, respect, and safety just being a more informed, educated citizen and neighbor to tribal nations and listening with openness and empathy and supporting tribal sovereignty, just being there and asking, what can I do? How can I support? Um, and where do you not need me to step in, right? And honestly, that sounds like an oversimplification, but it's that simple. Just showing up, just creating relationships and just being available where you can actually be helpful, um, where communities are telling you they can actually use support. Oops. See, this is why I don't like Prezi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some more concrete tips though, working in consultation with tribes, indigenous communities, organizations, and individuals, like put yourself out there, find opportunities. Um, Keeping in mind, there is a lot of turnover of different professions too, so being sensitive to that, but you know, reaching out to tribes and ask, is there anything I can help with? Um, and if they find that appropriate, yeah. And there's lots of people out there and lots of opportunities to just engage. Um, recognizing that most social work practice approaches and theories in the US have been developed from Western paradigm, we talked about that. 
um, pri privileging and actively supporting the sovereignty, well-being, and cultural and spiritual and land rights of indigenous people. We can do that in multiple ways just here on campus, just learning the real history of this land, of our university, of how our university came to be, of realizing and advocating for, like we just have the tribal education um, tuition promise that was passed that covers tuition, books, and all fees for um, Native students who are enrolled in Wisconsin Tribe to start attending here for four years consecutively starting next fall. Realizing why that is, it's a product of tri tribal sovereignty. Um, it's, it goes back to promises that were made through treaties to offer education and then land theft at the same time and saying like, oh, the university is taking a step to really actually support the sovereignty of tribal citizens and their importance to our university. So just educating yourself on like, okay, how, you know, we're having all these conversations about DEI and higher education and like questioning, okay, I'm curious if you don't know, how is that legal when we're having all those conversations? That's a good example for you to start learning about what tribal sovereignty is and why it's important, just looking into things that have been passed like that. Um, working with indigenous communities to implement traditional practices and philosophies in the contemporary context for the purpose of healing and empowerment of the community. And then when it comes to our work as social workers, and a lot of this is very much from a clinical perspective, but also just in general in any kind of work we do, um, for the most part, indigenous trauma has been largely diagnosed through non-indigenous theories, which doesn't always fit indigenous ways of knowing, of being, of understanding. Um, ourselves. Western frameworks of psychiatry and psychology have medicalized the experience of indigenous peoples, applying diagnoses such as post-traumatic stress disorder, further pathologizing their trauma. There are indigenous healthcare practitioners that utilize strategies rooted in indigenous philosophies, worldviews, and trauma-informed approaches. However, these practitioners are often challenged by a vocabulary that may not represent their context in an accurate way. So realize while indigenous communities are doing the work and are successfully doing the work not only to heal but to thrive, there's still challenges that our profession can maybe help with in terms of saying like this is how we view things and these are some important tools from a social work perspective and how can they fit with indigenous ways of knowing and actually be um, used in a relevant way. Okay, so now I'm going to go a little bit heavier um, and talk about trauma because it's really important and I always caveat this by saying when we talk about indigenous people in social work, we talk about the trauma. And indigenous people are so much more than their trauma. It does not define us. Um, it's just part of the experience of being indigenous in this colonial society. But it is, there's so much more, but it's also very important to talk about, but also talk about in the right way and accurately. Um, hold on. So I think sometimes in social work we don't even do a good job in general really defining trauma. Not everyone, some professors I know do a great job, but sometimes we have really simplistic um, conversations. We're always talking about trauma-informed care, and I think we're jumping ahead of ourselves sometimes and talking about that, expecting all students really understand what trauma is. So we have trauma versus stress. Stress is, you know, day-to-day -day stress. We all experience it. It can be, you know, showing up late for class. It can be um, having a really bad day. It can be more serious things that are ongoing that are not necessarily defined as trauma, but can overlap into trauma when they become really serious. Like 
you know, you're constantly behind on bills and struggling financially and you have a sick family member you're taking care of or you have health issues or, you know, you have all these things ongoing, that's where trauma overlaps into, or stress, I'm sorry, overlaps into toxic stress, which is, can become traumatic. Um, so stress can even be positive though, um, like um, not getting your paper in before a deadline and then you're stressed but you're like okay I'm motivated because I got this deadline that's positive stress or like um, even positive in the sense that it's not a positive situation but like life-saving like a life or death situation fight or flight mode um, you know stress can save your life in those brief short instances and then trauma is qualitatively different from other negative life stressors as it fundamentally shifts perceptions of reality. That's the difference between trauma and stress. There's situational trauma, so that's a one-time singular event. It can be still on a spectrum of mild to very severe, but it's like a one-time incident. Cumulative trauma is multiple traumas throughout your life. They could be related to each other, they could be totally different, but someone who's been subjected to ongoing various traumas. Um, and it can be subtle, I'm not gonna play the video for time, but like microaggressions. So um, dealing with that on an ongoing, continual basis, even if one microaggression, you know, you might be able to brush it off, but if you're dealing with it constantly, it builds up into something more serious. And then intergenerational trauma. So if trauma in one's own lifetime is not adequately addressed, it, how it can be passed on um, to children and youth. This is very important to understand these definitions. Hold on, I'll come back to what I was gonna say. Um, and then there's even further subtypes. So cultural trauma, attack on the fabric of a society, affecting the essence of a community and its members. Historical trauma, being the cumulative exposure to traumatic events that affect an individual. Um, and then intergenerational trauma, that's when historical, cultural, any kind of trauma or individual trauma is passed on from one generation to the next. Come back to that. Um, so the way I just described trauma as these definitions um, and particularly historical and intergenerational trauma, that's kind of the extent of how we talk about it, um, particularly with indigenous communities. And I think most of us nowadays are aware of the history of the boarding schools, hopefully, um, and the adoption projects, maybe the 60s scoop, um, and all the things I referenced at the beginning. Um, it's very easy to use the overly, in my opinion, overly simplistic model of looking at trauma in indigenous communities of one generation went to boarding school, they had a really bad experience, they didn't have um, they were subject to abuse there, they didn't have connection to their parents, so they didn't develop good parenting skills, good coping skills, so they passed that on to the next generation who also developed poor parenting skills, poor coping mechanisms, and so on. And yes, that's true, but there's so much more to it that if you don't understand, um, in my opinion again, I think that simplistic model can almost lead to harm for indigenous people and additional um, stereotyping, not just having the full picture um, and looking at it as, okay, I understand there's underlying trauma, but it's still very behavioral focused. Like, why don't you just change and heal and be a better parent and stop, um, stop being traumatized? Um, I'm just thinking of where I want to go. This is all mixed up from how I normally talk about it. Um, Okay, I'm kind of jumping topics, but this is really important um, and a very sensitive topic.
topic for indigenous communities. I just always acknowledge that. But substance dependency, and we're specifically going to look at alcohol use. Um, so first, just tell me what you observe from these sl slides. And this is from SAMHSA. It's, it's outdated. It's from 2010. I've got to update these, but it's still similar. Look specifically, OK, you probably can't all read it. People hmm? use a lot of, drink a lot of alcohol. Yeah. But they don't binge. Well, they binge, but like. I mean, the rates of binge drinking are kind of consistent mm -hmm. across groups. So the light blue is any use at all within a month. Can be one drink, it can be multiple. Gray is binge use and blue is heavy alcohol use. So, you know, we, we have an alcohol culture in this country and I want to actually pull up this data for Wisconsin and I keep meaning to put that in because that would be interesting. But, like, we have a problem and it's not unique to any one population, right? What do you notice about the American Indian Alaska Native group, though? Yeah? They're similar to white. In what way? Uh, the binge use and heavy alcohol use is the same. The yeah. Similar. And then the, the culture of white drinking is larger. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how do you, and how do you measure like binge drinking or, or abuse or alcoholism? It's like it's, it, it's, those are fine lines. Yeah. And I mean, this is just self-reported, but yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah. The rate of binge and heavy use is almost identical to the white. There are a few other hands. And the overall use is lower than any other group. Native Americans are the most sober population by race in the US. Now does that challenge your stereotypes? It's not part of Native culture to drink. Not that some don't and many don't responsibly, but it's not traditionally part of Native culture. Um, it's not conducive to living a traditional lifestyle. And like you were saying, we have these similar rates, but white culture and just US culture, there's a drinking culture. That's not so prevalent in native communities. So where you see the binge and heavy use, it's more attributed to trauma. Um, which means if we didn't have that historical and intergenerational trauma, those rates would be the lowest of all, for sure, without a doubt. Now, why this is important. First of all, I just like to show this slide to smash that stereotype. That's really satisfying to me. A um, few things. So 93%, according to the National Indian Child Welfare Association, 93% of ICWA cases have some kind of alcohol use involved by the parents or caregivers, guardians. So it is often this portion of the population that is drinking in a problematic way that ends up in the system, whether legitimately or not, because we still have stereotypes and biases. So that doesn't mean that every parent who somehow drinking factors into the case report means that it's necessarily problematic or tied to the abuse or neglect. It just is prevalent, both because of the amount of drinking that exists in response to trauma and because of the stereotypes and biases with white social workers and how they're perceiving um, any, like I just gave this example in class the other day, if you have a white family who's being investigated for abuse or neglect and a native family and you have a white family, typical Wisconsin has like a fridge full of beer and a stocked liquor cabinet and wine rack and they're gonna be like, oh, whatever, like you got alcohol in the house and native family maybe has like one bottle of wine up for a special occasion. They're gonna be like, oh, look at that, bad parenting. There's alcohol abuse in the house. That's the stereotype that plays in. That's um, a factor in a lot of decisions that white social workers make. Um, okay. Another interesting and really sad and unfortunate statistic, but this is really important to understand, 
this to me is a perfect explanation of how trauma works when we're talking about alcohol. So native people, as we know, aren't drinking any more than anyone else. Not at all. There is definitely a subset of problematic drinking behavior going on, but not drinking more than anyone else in the US. The mortality rate for alcohol, according to some sources, is up to 514% higher for native people. Now look at this slide, the impact of childhood trauma. Trauma physiologically, neurologically affects your body. It's not just a behavioral thing. Oh, bad ha things happen to me. I don't know how to um, show love, support to my children. I've turned to negative coping mechanisms. More goes on in your body, which is the part we sometimes ignore. What do you see? Can you all see that very well? what the orange bars versus the blue bars mean? Is that what you're asking us to look at? Um, I was thinking just these things right here, but yeah. This is the higher score on an ACE survey. Does anyone not know what ACEs are? I'm just assuming social workers do. Okay. The higher the score on an ACE survey, the more likely people will be to be in poor health. Um, orange is liver disease. Blue is COPD, chronic obstruct obstructive pulmonary disease. Yeah. I feel like there are a lot of like conditions that we associate with like lifestyle things. So then when we see this, we're thinking that it's like something behavioral. Like, oh, they yeah. just need to eat better, or they just need to exercise more, or stop drinking. When in reality, like, it's due to like trauma. Exactly. It's, there may or may not be negative lifestyle factors going on, but if there's trauma, those are compounded just naturally, even with a healthy lifestyle, and then you add in anything unhealthy, and it just, it's a snowball effect. Um, that, that indigenous communities and communities of color and other marginalized communities are experiencing, and it's being attributed to lifestyle all the time. And that's just, surface level little piece of it in some cases, not all. So that gets into, which we're all familiar with, social and economic factors that drive health outcomes. And um, so as social workers, we're very familiar with, you know, um, with social determinants of health and what all this means that basically our economic stability or lack thereof, our access to education, food, community, um, health care system and services we have access to, the neighborhood we live in, with racism and discrimination impacting each of these factors basically impacts our health, our mortality, our life expectancy, um, all kinds of things. I use this example to illustrate trauma. Oops, wrong slide. No. Nope. Um, and now I'm kind of getting away from indigenous communities specifically, but um, to explain how um, social determinants of health can impact us differently. I use this example that kind of ties into both trauma and so s social determinants of health. So we're going to all do a quick scenario. I spent a little more time in this in class, but go through it quickly. Imagining we are in a minor car accident. No one's hurt. Your car's totaled. Um, maybe some minor injuries, but nothing serious. You get out of the car, you walk away, you're fine. So what immediately when that other car hits you are you feeling? Adrenaline, which produces, anyone know? Cortisol. Cortisol, which does what? Raises your heart rate, spikes your nervous system, raises your blood pressure. Yeah, all of it. Heart rate, nervous system, it affects your nervous system functioning and processing, blood pressure, blood sugar. 
So long term leads to chronic health issues, experiencing stress like that. But we had one car accident, we had a brief increase in all those things, we're fine, right? Um, tomorrow you're probably going to get in the car and think about that accident, right? And it's going to be on your mind for a little bit, but if it's the only accident you have, after a while you're going to be fine, you're going to get in the car one day and not think about it for the first time. And you know, maybe if you have a close call again, you might get a little nervous, but you'll be fine eventually. So that's isolated, a singular trauma, and that's an example of a pretty minor trauma, but that is a trauma. So let's think about this in terms of um, what if, that's not what I was going to say, sorry, I lost my train of thought, I was going to say something else. Um, Okay, so let's think about this in terms of kind of as related to social determinants of health. So what happens after an accident? After the immediate, you get out, your heart rate's up, you're panicking, what do you do? You talk to the other driver, you call the police, you have to make a police report. Um, so right there, the police are showing up. How do you feel? Yeah, so some people might be relieved, like, oh, help is on the way. Some people may be super tense and maybe actually fear for their lives, if not somewhere on the spectrum of extreme tension and nervousness. So that's different for different people, right? Okay, so, but we made the police report, everything went fine. Um, it may have affected you emotionally, psychologically, but we got through that. They took the report, everything's fine. You, you know, get a ride home. Now what? Next day, cars totaled. Insurance. insurance. So, do you have the money? Do you have insurance? Did you get a ticket for not having insurance? On top of not having insurance, do you, can you afford to replace your car? Can you afford your deductible? Maybe that's no big deal for you. Um, whether you got money in savings or you put it on a credit card, it's not a big, or maybe like you have no way to pay that or you don't have insurance, how are you gonna replace your car? So this could be a minor inconvenience for some people. Yeah, it's annoying, it's stressful, you'll be fine. You'll figure it out, you'll move on with your life, you'll get a loaner car. Um, for some people, this can be a huge deal that continues to get worse and worse as we go along, right? So um, now I don't have a car, maybe I don't live on a bus line, I have no way to get to work. This could have like really, really serious impacts. Okay, so that's the difference kind of relating trauma to socioeconomic status and how these are going to impact people differently and make some people experience trauma much more severely than other people. And now let's think about this intergenerationally. So, okay, so you had your accident um, and yeah, we talked about you're going to be a little more tense and nervous behind the wheel for a while. So what if by that initial tension, apprehension, um, you're not being as defensive and proactive as a driver as you usually are and you get in another accident because you are you panic in the moment and you don't know what to do. And then this continues on and you just keep getting in car accidents. Now that stress of the initial accident isn't going to go away because you've kept experiencing it, right? So now you have a 16 year old daughter and it's time to teach her how to drive. How does that go? Set her up for fear. Set her up for fear, yeah, instead of being a safe, right. So that's how intergenerational trauma gets passed on. And that was a really quick condensed version of explaining like, what is trauma, how does it develop, and how does our, our social determinants of health impact how we experience trauma? Um, where are we at? Okay. Um, okay. I know I kind of went off onto a very general um, train of thought, so I want to, I'm trying to think of where to connect it back. Um, but again, um, I'll go to this slide. Just recognizing 
To be an ally to Indigenous people, all you've got to do is continue educating yourself and show up um, and not be scared to make mistakes if you're coming in with good intentions. You're going to make mistakes and that's fine. Um, you know how you're in with indigenous people, they'll start joking with you about it. So if you make a mistake and someone makes a joke about it, you're good. Don't take offense to it. It might be like, oh, they're being so mean. No. Um, and it's also their little way of correcting you, but in a humorous way. Like, you're good. Don't do that again, but you're fine. So. We just as social workers can have a supportive role and show up for indigenous people and listen um, to how, how they tell us we can be helpful. Um, I have two different videos, three potentially music videos I can show. As an end, I always like to use indigenous music from indigenous artists when I teach um, and they all kind of have a different vibe to them. but. I might play them all, but first, are there any questions before I wrap up? Um, do you have particular documentaries or books that immediately come to mind when you're like, you start with this one? Like lighter um, stuff or more serious? Either. Um, Facts or, uh, and also narrative um, shows, films. I put a few recommendations here. Um, I mean, just as a lighter, like comedy, Reservation Dogs is great, Rutherford Falls, um, both two shows I think everyone should watch. Two books that are like, they, they are young reader books, so they read pretty easy and they're kind of like almost Nancy Drew type murder mysteries. Um, but they touch on really real serious topics in indigenous communities are Firekeeper's Daughter and there's a second one that just came out, um, Warrior Girl on Earth. I haven't finished Warrior Girl on Earth, but Firekeeper's Daughter is great. Um, Ancestor Approved is adorable. It's a kid's book, but the first chapter had me bawling my eyes out in a good way. It was just so touching and adorable but it's a bunch of cute stories about different kids from around the country all going to the same powwow and like their stories all kind of intertwine. Um, lots of native comedians. Um, you can look up all kinds of lists of places to shop for native and indigenous owned businesses. So those are all kind of on the lighter, just, you know, entertainment um, side of things. More seriously, I personally really like the movie Rhymes for Young Ghouls. Um, but it is very heavy. Um, it is fictional. It kind of, I've read some reviews that describe it as like kind of Tarantino-esque, which I think is pretty fitting, but it's about boarding schools. Um, I just caution people that there is some alcohol and drug use as kind of central to the plot that I think if you weren't like aware of some of the things we talked about today might reinforce stereotypes, but it is indigenous produced and acted um, and I've, I've assigned it before in my class and people have said it's really, if they weren't familiar with the boarding schools, kind of helped actually visualize how the boarding schools were present in native communities. Um, documentaries, I mean there's so many I can't even, um, I had one and I forgot. Books um, that are more educational and not fiction, there's one called Lost Children of the Indian Adoption Projects. It's a lot of short stories about Native children who are adopted out of their families and their firsthand experience and how that impacted them. Um, there are a lot of documentaries out there, um, particularly about the boarding schools, also about the adoption projects. I can't think of one that pops to mind immediately, but. Um, they are definitely out there and there's really good lists too if you're not sure um, that you can just like Google um, that are recommended books and documentaries and movies by indigenous people just to make sure you're watching the right things. Okay, um, yeah. Um, are there any um, like larger advocacy organizations that you recommend following that like you found are more grassroots and like actually involving indigenous communities <coughs> in their advocacy? 
again, I don't even know where okay. to start. Um, I just feel like I hear from a lot of people of like, who can I connect with that's like, I would start by following indigenous media sources okay. to be seeing kind of what what are the issues um, right. and a lot of them would have organizations. Um, I forgot to, whew, I don't know why it does that. I forgot to actually end on a positive note here on campus, but it's diagonal. Um, so we are building resilient networks. Um, here within the indigenous community on campus and it's been it's just been amazing like better than I ever imagined when we started doing this work but we have the aunties uncles cousins and relatives um, which is obviously just a more culturally relevant and approachable um, title for us as staff instead of me saying I'm the Indigenous Student Services Coordinator. I don't even know what that means. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But I know what an auntie does um, and students do. So they come to us um, and we are staff all across campus. We have created here on campus a very grassroots network of creating systems and structures of support for Indigenous students. Um, one of those being a program that's actually been institutionalized and uh, it's the program I oversee and all the aunties are very important to that. I can't do it without them. I say aunties because we mostly have aunties even though we have titles to be inclusive, but we have one uncle right now. Um, but this is a fellowship. This is um, old testimonials from the first cohort. We're going into our fourth cohort, third cohort next year. Um, but we have a fellowship program where students are paid a stipend of $250 a month. So that's another commitment the university is making to indigenous students um, to participate in all kinds of um, activities on campus, academic, cultural, community-based, um, professional development, and students can really tailor the experience to what they want to get out of it or what they need from it if there's support needs. Um, but there's clear expectations of time commitment that they have to put in to get their stipend. Um, but the product coming of that is that they connected with so much more Native staff on campus with each other. Um, you can read these testimonials. There's, I have even better ones somewhere. It's just been... I think this is how we should approach social work. We always talk about inner departmental, inner um, team social work or approaches to, um, to social services, to health care. But if we really took this approach of bringing ourselves just as aunties to our interactions with students, it would be a lot more meaningful than, oh, I'm, I'm a clinician, I'm a child welfare worker, um, if we could approach social work in a different way. Okay, so I didn't get to the videos. Is there one last question before we're done? Well, I'll play the happy one while we're walking out then. And you can feel free to leave whenever I just put this on to end in a happy way.